Welcome to Ask the Author from the Ulster American Folk Park in Oma. Marita Conlon McKenna is one of Ireland's most popular children's authors. She has won several literary awards, including Bisto Book of the Year Award in 1993. Marita has written more than 20 books. Her first novel, Under the Hawthorn Tree, has become a bestseller and is one of the most popular books in school libraries. The novel has been described as the biggest success story in children's historical fiction. Since it was first published in 1990, it has been translated into several languages and read in many countries worldwide. The popularity of Under the Hawthorn Tree has led to two further novels, The Wildflower Girl and Fields of Home, which complete Morita's famine trilogy of books. The novel tells the story of three children who lived in Ireland at the time of the potato famine in the 1850s. A blight or fungus had affected the potato crop and poor people living in rural communities were deprived of their main source of food. Haley, Michael and Peggy, like many other children at the time, had grown weak with hunger. Their father had left home a few weeks previously to find work. When he did not return to the family home, their mother was forced to leave the children alone for a few days while she set off to look for him. When neither parent returns, faced with being forced into a workhouse, the three children set off on a long journey across Ireland in search of the great aunts their mother had told them stories about. The children face many difficulties and hardships on the way, but in a story of adventure, courage and determination, they never give up. We hand over now to Eamon McAteer and Marita, who are in the famine house in the folk park. Welcome today to the Ulster American Folk Park in Oma, where we have a very special guest to talk to all the schools across Northern Ireland and in the south of Ireland. We have Marita Conlon McKenna, one of the most famous authors of children's books, and in particular we're going to talk today about Under the Hawthorn Tree. You're very welcome, Marita, and thanks, thanks for Eamon. joining us. I'm so happy to be here and to get a chance to talk to so many of my readers is just unbelievable. It's a huge thing for me. Well, from, from our perspective, all these children have been emailing in questions and their teachers registering for this because they're interested in I your book and you, <laughs> so and you as people. an author. So we'll start off with the main question, one of the most popular questions we've got, is where did you get the inspiration from to write Under the Hawthorn Tree? Um, well, Under the Hawthorn Tree is set during the Ireland's Great Famine. So when I was growing up, I was mad on history, obsessed with history. And um, also, my mum was from West Cork. So my mum had talked to me about the famine. And if you go down to Skip Green, where she's from, there's a lot of, there's a famine graveyard. So it was always in the background about the famine. So a combination of me loving history, hearing it from my family in Skibreen, and then, but the third most important thing was, there's always a little thing that makes you go do something. It was that I heard the story about a school down the country and there was a big hawthorn tree in the field and they decided to cut it down to make a football pitch and drain the field. And when the poor man came in to cut it down and the, the bulldozer came to get out the tree, the roots, um, they discovered three skeletons. And the skeletons were three children and they had died during Ireland's Great Famine and had been buried under there. And I remember the, the teacher from the school was being interviewed and she said, oh, I've been trying to teach them about the famine. It goes in one ear and out the other ear and they never remember, they never care. And suddenly they were saying, who were these kids? What happened to them? Why were they buried under a hawthorn tree? How did they die? Because they did bone density aging on the skeletons and they found there were three children from the time of the famine. And so um, that really was the, the, the actual kickstart for me then to do the book. And I couldn't get these three dead children out of my head because I had children of my own. I was thinking, imagine a mother burying three children or neighbours burying a family under a hawthorn tree. And of course, the hawthorn is a fairy magical tree. That's why they were buried there and it would never be cut down. So um, that was really the three things all came together to make me write the book. And that, that you know, traditionally children's books are about fairies. I and know. Things. So that's a hard topic to cover. Were you a bit intimidated with that? I was because I'm not a historian by profession. I'm not an academic. But I was thinking it totally from the point of view of children. And I had children going, my own children. And I, I'm such a mad reader. And I remember reading, I would read books from all around the world. 
But in terms of Irish children's books, um, children in Irish books were usually the stupid person or the foolish person that the fairies fooled. They were never very clever or never very bright, okay. which I rebelled against as yes. a reader and as a child. So I wanted my, my children and my story to be very strong, very brave, very resourceful, as I would have thought I would have been as a kid myself. Yes. So I created these, and my children were alive, they weren't dead, and they were walking. Okay. And this journey this was a really big part because when I read about the famine, so many people had to go on journeys. They walked to leave their place, they had to go to the workhouse, they had to walk to another town to get work to survive. And also, of course, those who made a huge journey and went overseas to America and to other countries. Yep. So um, journeying was part of the famine, really. So I wanted to capture that in the book I was writing. I was only writing it for myself and my children. Never thought it would go beyond that. To, to turn out to what we're doing uh, today, no, some no, I 20 years I never later. I never expected that at all. But um, I got really into the story and uh, researched about the famine. But the Hawthorne tree was so important because, um, you know, it's this magical thing of Ireland. And uh, I remember I in the book, I buried one of the children. Uh, there was four of them and one little baby sister dies and she's buried under the Hawthorne tree. And I remember uh, my publisher, when he took the book, he said people would object to... Like literally in the first page, the children, the, the baby dies, you know. Yes. And he says it's very tough. And it was very tough. But I kind of knew, if you're writing a, a story about the famine, you have to grab your reader and hold on to them. Yeah. Because I'd have every reason to say, I don't want to read a book about the famine. Why would I? But of course, when they're thrown into a cottage, which is much like this, with a baby sick, and you know the baby's going to die, you have to know what happens. So I knew they'd turn the page to find out what would happen because I would have as a reader too. So um, I had to grab my reader and hold on to them and keep writing. Now, and a question here from Kate, who's primary seven in yeah. Eglintine. Um, are the family characters based on real life? Well, they're, they're not real people. To me, they have become real. But, you know, in a family, there's a dynamic of the older sister, the middle kid, the little kid. So the older sister, the older girl, Eileen's probably based very much on my older daughter, who was like, and, and if you're an older sister or older brother, you're like the little mother or little father. And then, you know, Michael, he's the boy, so he's the one who has to do the hard stuff. He's the one who has to kill an animal. He's to do the horrible stuff, which boys kind of have to do in a family yes. as well, bring out the bins, do the stuff like that. And then Peggy, of course, because she's the youngest, she's the one who's picking wildflowers and daydreaming of a better life and, and, and kind of annoying the other sometimes, but yet they have to mind her. And yet she's the free-spirited one of the family. She hasn't got that pressure on her, you know, that younger children often have in a family. They're the free spirits. Thanks, Marita. We have a question from uh, Miss Carson uh, in All Saints in Tally Sala. Uh, would you like would like to know which book was the most interesting to write uh, out of the uh, the Famine trilogy? Well, when why? I'm writing a book, I get so involved in it, every bit of it is important to me. So I do a lot of research. So obviously, under the Hawthorne Tree, it was the research about the famine, which is you know the National Library in Dublin. Um, looking at famine, pictures of the famine, reports of the famine, finding out the famine is so interesting. Then in Wildflower Girl, um, which is set in America, Peggy emigrates to America on one of these ships. So actually finding out about the ship, going over on the ship, what it was like, the conditions, looking at the ship's lists. And then I went to Boston. I was very good in Boston. They gave me free reign okay. in my research. The Boston Public Library and the Gibson House and all that. So um, I love researching. And the third book was more about land and uh, how it was after the famine, how people survived and how they had to change things. And also um, the book, um, Michael is very much involved in, in horses and racing. They were great. So I, I remember even actually watching a foal being delivered, a film of, I was trying to actually see a foal being delivered, but they all, they all get born in the middle of the night. So I, I wasn't up in time to go down for a delivery of a foal. So I actually managed to catch one on film and see that. I, I, people say I'm crazy to be researching so much, but I think it just makes the book a little bit more real when you do these things, you know, and, and makes it work better. For me, it does. I'm a curiosity box. Yep. Sophie from Dixon Primary School in Lurgan would like to know who were the main influences on you uh, as a young writer? Well, as a writer, I suppose all the books I read, I started reading very early and I'm very lucky I'm a good reader. So all the Ian Blyton, um, uh, Eve Garnett, um, all, the, all the brilliant children's writers I read. And it sounds awful to say, but the bad writers too influenced me because they made me realise I don't want to do a book like that. I remember reading uh, Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, reading um, Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates and books like that. And I love my books to have adventure in them and something to happen. I didn't want them to be boring. And of course, when I was writing them, I, I said, well, I'm not going to really write a boring book. I hope not anyway. I want something to happen in my book. So a lot of stuff happens in my books. There's always the adventure 
but there's also then the inner kind of journey. And I love the combination of an outer something happening, but also a very much change in the person themselves inside too. But it's very important, and that's the way our lives run, that outside things happen us, but inside we're, we're growing and changing all the time too. Mm -hmm. uh, Caitlin from uh, um, Elmgrove Primary <coughs> School. Do you think Under the Hawthorne Tree is the best book you've ever written? Um, well, it's the most popular, but every time when I'm writing a book, to me, that's the best book because I'm so involved with the characters and the story and I'm eating and sleeping and thinking about them the whole time, so that becomes the best book. But I know Under the Hawthorne Tree is probably my most popular book, the one that's so the most. And when I go back and I read the books, it's like I said, God, how did I actually write that book? And it worked out so well. And... Um, there's no kind of um, stuff I go back and cut out of it or change because it, you know, the book is done when it's done. And um, I'm usually very proud and happy with my books at the end. It's, uh, you're tired and you're drained, but it's great to have done them and to see them there. And the fact the books are still you know, being published and reprinted and republished and coming out in different countries all the time and children all over the world reading them, it really um, surprises you. But you see, I'm a writer, so I'm busy on my new book. And I don't think about that because if you kept thinking about that, you'd go mad and you say, oh, I'll never write another book as good as Under the Hawthorne Tree or I'll never do this as good as I did before, you know. You've got to move on and keep writing. If you're a writer, it's so important to keep writing. A lot of people make that mistake. They write one book and then they don't write anything else. Yeah. Well, I have a question here from Brian, who's primary seven from Star of the Sea primary school wants to know if you're working on a new book and if so what's it about and um, well you see my head is always full of stories so I'm finishing um, an adult book which is called um, the Rose Garden which is set at a lovely old house called Mossbourne and this lady her husband dies and she's very lonely and lost and um, she decides she thinks she's going to sell the house but she decides to restore this garden I'm really into gardens and roses and of course every old house is a story so I'm just finishing that one at the moment and then I'm into a new children's book called Two about this girl Jess and her mum and dad um, get divorced and separate and poor Jess is like Solomon's baby she is cut in half her dad wants her one way her mum wants it the other way and she's living in two houses okay. and she's two different pets two different bedrooms eats two different types of food and her whole life is cut down the middle so it's called two so that's the one I'm working on at the moment um, we have a question from Anna Hilt primary school uh, did you visit anywhere to capture the context of the story of um, Under the Hawthorne Tree? And I think this is very relevant to where we're sitting here in this, this cottage, famine yeah. cottage. Well, I think, yeah, when I'm researching, I try and go to places as much as I can. So when Under the Hawthorne Tree, I was finding out about the famine. But as I said, my family from West Cork, and actually my grandmother is bar buried in the famine graveyard um, in, in Skibreen. So I had been in that graveyard, you know, and know the things and know the story. So I know the countryside quite well. So it's very important. And then, as I said, I went to Boston for Wildflower Girl. But actually for Wildflower Girl, I came up here to the Ulster American Folk Park. It had just opened. And the, the ship, the mock-up of the ship you can go on, which isn't actually the same period, a little bit different. But um, I came up and I sat on that and sat on the bunk and pretended I was Peggy for practically a whole day. So I got impregnated with the smells of the ship and everything. And um, I love researching. And then I walked the streets in Boston and down where um, uh, Peggy would come off the ship in Boston and what the streets were like. And the house, I went to a house and seen where the kitchen where she would have worked. And um, I like that detail. And I love going and exploring places. And every book I do, I do that. I did another book about making hats. And of course, I had to learn how to make a hat. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just one of those people that likes doing this thing. And as I said, I think being curious in life is actually a great um, virtue to have because you never get bored and you're always curious, curious about people and about things and doing things and history and places. Fantastic, Marita. We're going to go back to the classrooms now that you're all in and we want you to have a discussion with your teacher about have you ever been so hungry that your tummy rumbled? This is a story about the famine and we want you to talk to each other about the time that you were really hungry, you remember being really, really hungry and try and imagine what it would be like to have that for days, maybe weeks, where you're living on small amounts of food. So if we go back to the classrooms, we're going to take a five minute break. Also, if the teachers want to take a picture of your class watching the, the video conference over the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, then you can submit that to our Learning NI course where Marita will be nipping in and taking some questions and making some points to the various discussions that you're, you're going to be included in. So we'll take five minutes and we'll come back to you in five minutes. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed your discussion uh, in the class and you can continue that discussion online in your Learning NI course or your Dissolving Boundary course, uh, whichever you're, you're brought into. Uh, Marita, just on that point about hunger, uh, there's some very interesting information you have about when you get really hungry. When I was researching the book, um, the one thing is when you're hungry, um, the beginning you're starving, you're hungry and the whole time looking for food and then gradually that dissipates and in the book, if you read the book, you know, Peggy's the whole time looking for food and the whole time trying to get food. But as the story goes on, um, you less and less start looking for food. You get quieter and quieter. And when you do eat food, um, it actually can make you sick and you get terrible pain to the stomach, maybe vomiting and that. So, and that happens in Africa if you've been very sick and you've been in hospital. If you have an operation and you haven't been eating for a few days, the nurses won't come in with a big tray of food to you. They'll give you fluids and then they'll give you water and then, you, I mean, might even give you only a, a stick with ice and water on the first day and then you're on a kind of soupy thing, a liquid. And it won't be till day three or four you'll actually pop properly be given a meal because your tummies change and that's what happened during the famine people got hungry and hungrier and hungrier and then in the end in the beginning they were always looking for food and fighting for food and you know, searching for food but gradually as you get tired and your stomach you get weaker and tarder you're not as hungry and then of course that's the danger period then that you go down that slide that you get sick and give up you know and um, the thing is, it's, the thing is not to give up and we see that on the television with famines and people going to refugee camps and you know, and sometimes the babies you see them in the telly and they're no longer looking for food because, and they're trying to, you know, almost force feed them this paste and things like that and get them nourished, you know. Okay, so that can add to your dis <coughs> discussions uh, online, what uh, we've just heard there. We have Limerick, uh, third and fourth. How, do you feel, how did you feel when you first got your, 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 when you got your first uh, book published? Well, first of all, I couldn't believe it because I hadn't written it to be published. I wrote it from my daughter and my children. I thought my children would read it, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren in the future. And I didn't expect it to be published. But when my publisher took it, he was a bit nervous about it because of the topic. But then when the book came out and I had the illustrations from Donald Teskey and I held it in my hand, I couldn't believe I had actually done this because since I was a little girl of six or seven, I had dreamed of writing a book and having one book on one shelf. And... The dream I had when I was seven to suddenly happen, you know, when I was grown up and happen. I was so delighted and then to go into bookshops and see it. But really, um, there's a, a two-fold thing when you're writing. You as a writer, writing, but then it's to reach your reader. And then when you reach the readers, that's really when you feel you are a writer because um, you, know, you can write lots of books and nobody reads them and it's not much good to you. But when you have start getting letters from people and people reading and using your books and t talking to you about them, then the story takes a life of its own and um, it's kind of weird because my books have kind of taken a life of their own kind of nearly without me <laughs> and well, gone on and, and people do all kinds of things like making musicals of them doing projects on them doing games on them all kinds of stuff and um, so uh, film you know everything so um, writing music about the story so it's kind of amazing which I never expected but I think you know when you write a good story in your head you see it and then you hope that other people read it and they see it too. And that's the magic of writing and reading that you look at the words on the page and they're not just words, they're actually a picture that comes in your head and then you read it and it works and hopefully works. Okay, so just to, to, to recap, you can continue your video conference, uh, what you've learned in your video conference through your online learning course in Learning NI or through your Dissolving Boundary course. And you'll discuss elements of hunger and just what we heard there from, from Marita in terms of your stomach shrinking and you can't just immediately, we, we all think of eating a big meal, but you can't do that or you'd be sick. And yeah. So you can continue that discussion there. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We have a question from Katie uh, from Dixon Primary School. And she would love to know, uh, how long did it take you to write Under the Hawthorne Tree? 12 weeks. I have never written a book so quickly before. Um, but as I said, I didn't <coughs> think it was a book. I thought it was a story I was writing. I was obsessed with about it. I was... From the minute I heard the story about the, the hawthorn tree that children, the skeletons found, I started writing my kitchen table in a notepad. And I'd write at night when my kids were gone to bed. I'd get up early in the morning. My little boy was only a baby. If he had a nap, I'd write. I was like a, a person possessed. <laughs> and I had every reason to say, I'm not writing the story, and put it in a cupboard and say, I'll come back when my children are older and I'm less busy and do it. But I wrote it very quickly. And um, it's funny, I think things you write quickly and get so involved in, and you're passionate about work really, really well. It was really quickly and um, when you read the book, 
it, it's a, not a very big book. It's quite a slim book. It reads very quickly too, but um, I couldn't put them away. And I kept every night going to bed dreaming the story, what was happening to them and where they were going and how they were managing to survive. Well, we have a question from All Saints Primary School in Taddy Ray. And the question from the pupils there is, did you ever think that your books would become so popular? No, because my publisher was saying to me, oh, I don't know if anybody will let a kid read a book about the famine where people die and they see bodies and things like that. So I had no expectation of that at all. So it has totally surprised and amazed me. But then I think uh, writing surprises you and kids surprise you what, what they like and what they don't like. And sometimes you can do a book you think it's going to do brilliantly and then it doesn't do it all. And then something happens, you know, like there's Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling, no publisher would take her. And then, of course, I think kids actually decide what books work and what doesn't work more than publishers and adults and teachers and people. It's kids decide. Yeah. And that's what happened. The book came out in May. And I remember... Gradually, and by Christmas, it had become huge, and book worldwide has been sold all over the world. It just grew. Kids made it their own, really, rather than publishers and teachers and adults. It was kids who wanted to read it and told their friends, and then they had to print more of them. You know? mm -hmm. uh, we have a very good question from Olivia uh, from Eden Derry Primary School, and she wants to know if she wanted to be an author, what advice would you give to her? Well, the best advice I can give you to be a writer is to read. It's really hard to be a writer if you haven't read other books by other people. I don't mean you copy other people, but just to see how a structure of a book works. And also to write. And to write, I was sort of writing really when I was very young, about six or seven, eight. And I had little notepads and pens and everything all over, scraps of things. If I went to a film, I'd write about the film. If I went to see a place, I'd write about it. I was always writing letters and postcards and things, even shopping lists. I'd write the shopping list and get used to putting words on page. And the main thing is you are good at writing is if you have all these copy books and, you know, at the end of term in school, at the end of the summer, you get your copy book and your English copy book. Don't let your mum throw that copy book out. You can throw your maths books and your geography book and everything out, but not your English. Keep that one. And just keep your stuff because it's an amazing story. You would have played around it when you were 10, 11, 12 may turn out to be a story you're writing again when you're much older with different elements in it and get used to reading and writing and if you wanted to be a footballer or a tennis player or a cricket player or boxer whatever you wanted to be you're probably always doing that when you from your about 10 11 12 and it's the same with writing and reading you're probably the person who's stuck in the corner with a book and of course now you know you have the computer and your ipads and all this and it's much easier because you can save everything you're not relying on all these little pads all over the house and bits of paper that you lose so you can put it all in a folder and a file up on the family computer and have all your stuff in that and also scan and stuff if you're interested i'm always um, with scissors cutting out bits of newspaper and things like that and be curious about life best advice to be curious I think it's a really good thing if you want to work in writing in film and television in the arts and media and journalism be curious very good thing in life we, we had talked about all, all the different sports and occupations yeah. and being curious and trying different kind of thing, yeah. uh, things to see what it is is your niche yeah. that, that you want to follow your, your path in life it's very important because um, it's really funny how what you want to do when you're younger is really often what you end up doing when you're older. It makes you happy. And sometimes people, it's hard because they get pushed into doing something they don't want to do. And they don't do it as well. And then they're kind of not as happy in their life as they could be. So try and make it that, even if it doesn't become your main career when you're older, but it's your hobby, your passion. You might be really passionate about history or geography or plants or beekeeping or whatever it is. I don't know. Or makeup or, you know, ice skating, whatever. But whatever your passion is, do that thing very, very well, even if it's only in a, you know, after school for a little while or the holidays or whatever. And um, or if you like drawing, drawing, or if you're mad on pets and horses and dogs, whatever you, whatever your thing is. But everybody has their thing, and we're all so different. If you sit in a classroom and there's 25 or 30 people in the classroom, there's not one person like the other. When you so get, they're all different. So the 2,000 odd children that are watching this now, they're all different. They're all then, different. Yeah. And everybody has different talents and things they love. And, and they, that doesn't mean you can't be friends. Everybody's friends. But they, they have a different skill and a different thing. And to, to try and use that is really important. OK, we have a question here from uh, St. Bridget's Glass Drummond. And uh, St. Bridget's, unfortunately, were supposed to be here uh, on the uh, I was looking today. forward to meeting them. <laughs> on the I know the today, snow but they were has done it to us. In, yeah. in, in Glass Drummond in South Armagh. So, um, hello everyone there. Uh, why did you want to become an author and how has it changed your life? Well, I think when I was, you know, as I said, I started reading and writing very young. 
and um, I didn't see how I could become an author. I had was my secret dream to be one, but I never saw how that would be possible for me to be one because in Ireland the writers were all very famous people like, you know, Yeats and Joyce and and Beckett, all these very stern men, you know, with glasses, you know, and I'm like this uh, bouncy, bubbly, blonde person who's totally opposite to that. So I didn't see how that could happen. But the more I read, the more I realised I wanted to write stories and tell stories. And uh, so I wanted to do that. And then I'm very lucky it has happened that this first little book I wrote became this very big bestseller. And um, I've since writing. It has changed my life because um, I wrote it, as I said, for my own children. And that's all my ambition for it was. But now, you know, I remember then after Under the Hawthorne Tree came out, my publisher came back and said, what's your next book about? Now, I actually had no next book. And I suddenly had to think of my feet. And then I said, oh, I'm going to write about little Skivvy going to America. And then since then, there's always been a next book. And I've had to take um, what was kind of a fun you know, thing I love doing, reading and writing. And it's become my career. I take it more serious. And now I do take it more serious. And I need to research. I'll find out the stuff. I give it time. Um, I deal with my publishers properly. I, I take the whole thing much more serious. It's still, I love doing it. It's still fun. And I absolutely love doing it. But actually, I realised that, um, you know, my job is to write books. It's not to be gallivanting around the place doing nothing. Yeah. It, my job is to sit at my desk at two o'clock in the morning with my computer on or a pad on my knee writing or I'm on the train like I was yesterday with a pad on the, ta on, the, on, the, on the train writing. That's actually my job. It's what I do. And I love doing it. And I have to stop other things interfering because life gets so busy and, oh, do you want to go here? Do you want to do this? We go shopping when we do this. I want to write and have to make time for it. I wanted to be swimming or playing tennis or playing golf. I, I'd have to make time for it. And I have to make time for the writing. And that's the one thing people think because it's not a sport or um, a thing you see people out in a court doing, you know, are very visual because writing is you on a chair and a desk or a computer. So it's not very exciting to look at in terms of, you know, viewing <laughs> But um, if you want to do it, you have to make the time for it. And that's the only thing is to give time to it and time to yourself to think and about things and work it out. We have a question here from Nazareth House uh, Primary School. Um, Mr. McCrossan's class would like to know if your other two books are going to become films, movies. Um, the first film, the first book was made into yeah. a film and there's, is there news of it going to be made well, into Well, we're hoping, I'm hoping that um, eventually we'll be looking at another version of Under the Hawthorn Tree, a bigger, bigger scale version um, of Under the Hawthorn Tree. It was actually made into a musical in Canada and just seeing it on stage, how it worked, really would inspire you then to see it in terms of a film as well. So something like that. But, you know, every book you get, you hope it's going to be a film because I visualise every book and see it like in terms of a film when I'm writing it. I feel like I'm on a film set and I'm moving the characters around. Yep. And then you hope that somebody else will say, oh, yeah, that would make a great, great film, you know. I, and you were saying that um, is Under the Hawthorn Tree made into a musical, did you say? Yeah, in Canada it was a musical and um, I just thought this will never work on stage. But it really did, and um, it was only in a small theatre, but it worked very, very well. And in the book, I don't know if you remember, the kids were attacked by dogs, because during the famine, people didn't kill their dogs, and these dogs packed together. And it was terrible because the dogs were in a frenzy, and they were heart starving, and they were used to being around the cabins and cottages around people. They weren't used to being out on their own, abandoned. And then when they'd, they'd hear footsteps of people coming, they'd they charged them, but they'd attack them. They tried to actually eat them, to be honest. And um, so the kids get attacked by these dogs in the book, and it is very scary. And it's a scare. I was attacked by a dog once when I was a kid myself. Even though I have dogs and I love dogs, but um, but then I just thought they never put that on stage. But they actually had these actors and animatronics and costumes, like and moving like dogs, and it was actually really scary. They did it really, really well. So um, it's amazing what what technology can do now in terms of. Um, you know the stage and, and 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 putting stuff on. Hopefully that'll come over here. I'd love we'll I'd love a venture if it will. The music yeah. was really good. The songs are really good. Brilliant. We're going to take another uh, five minute break for you to have another discussion in your classroom, and this this discussion is based on famine. And do you think famine could happen again in Ireland? Uh, if so, why? Or if you don't think so, why not? And why does famine still happen in parts of the world? And if you can discuss that with your teachers and among each other, that will also be explored in the Learning NI and the Dissolving Boundary discussion area. So if you have that little discussion, we'll take five minutes from now and we'll come back to you for the last 10 minutes of the video conference with Marita and we'll take some more questions. So five minutes from now, we'll come back again. Thank you. 
I hope you enjoyed your discussion uh, about famine and it's a very serious, very sad subject, but one that maybe you want to explore further in your online discussions. I would like to again uh, mention that you may want to take a picture, your teacher may want to take a picture of your class watching this and then upload it so we can all see all the different classes. We have 113 schools joining us today, which is amazing. And if the teachers could again, if they haven't registered, uh, there should be a slide up or there'll be a slide up shortly with an email address for you to email with the, your school name, the number of pupils taking part and if you want to be involved in future video conferences we'd love to have you join us again. Uh, we're going to take some more questions now and um, we have a, a number of schools have asked what technology do you use when writing a book? Well, um, the main technology I use is a nice uh, pen and a pad. <laughs> I always have them steadily since I was a little girl. And well, I have a laptop and I have a computer and I use that the whole time and it's great because I can change things around and save stuff and I can save stuff for research as well. I have big research files as well. But then my whole study is full of actual physical folders and files with stuff in that as well because I'm a magpie and curiosity box. So I use a computer and it's great having the computer now. But still, I wouldn't go out without my pad and pen. Because even if I'm sitting in my car waiting somewhere, I'll, I'll, I'll start scribbling or on the train, I'll write or whatever. I just uh, I would feel lost without that with me. We have a question. Old fashioned that way. <laughs> we have a question from Jenna in, in Port Stewart. And she wants to know, how has, become, how has being a famous uh, author changed your life? Does it get you into places? Does it? it I don't think it has changed my life at all because I'm hopefully the same person I always was. Um, I suppose the odd time I get to meet somebody very famous or whatever and, and invite you to things and that. And, but the main thing is actually people are really good. If I'm out, they come up and say, I read your book, I love your book, and can you sign this to me and that? And I love doing that. So that's the only change. But I think um, I think there's so many writers in Ireland. <laughs> it's not a really big deal. And... Um, I just try to go out my normal life, and most people know I'm, I'm not like that at all. I'm not precious about my life at all. Well, well we think it's a big deal having <laughs> you here. So, uh, Jack, from, uh, who's a primary seven from St Joseph's Primary School, uh, how, did you become, how did you come up with the titles for the books? Well, the first one, Under the Hawthorne Tree, the minute, literally, as I put that first day, my, my pen on the piece of paper on my kitchen table, the name under the Hawthorne tree because I just heard the teacher talking about the Hawthorne tree with the three bodies, three skeletons. So um, under the Hawthorne tree. But I remember when I'd read, finished the book, and I'd called it under the Hawthorne tree. And I sent it to the publisher. Eventually, every kept reading and saying, "Send it to a publisher." And I did. And one of the first things he said to me was, when the book was coming out, he said, "Well, of course, you know, we're not calling it under the Hawthorne tree." I said, "What?" And he said, "No." He said, nobody, who, who's going to read a book called Under the Hawthorne Tree? It's a terrible name. And he said, oh, we'll call it something else. And I was saying, no, hold on. Um, I, these three skeletons were found under a Hawthorne tree and it has to be called Under the Hawthorne Tree. And he said, no, no, we can do a little Hawthorne Tree in the back of the book and we'll put Under the Hawthorne Tree. But he said, we're calling it a different name. And I kept saying, and it was the one, only thing, I don't know how I had the courage to fight for it, but I did. I just felt it was so important because it was pivotal in the book, really. And... Um, and then it was so funny because American rights were sold and my American publishers bought it. I remember they phoned and they said to my publisher, we love this book, we're dying for it to come out in America and kids, American kids treat it. And they said, and of course, you know, we love the title Under the Hawthorne Tree. It is such a good title, you know, it's a lovely name. And my publisher started saying, well, actually, no, uh, we're not, we're changing the name. It's not going to be called that at all. And they said, oh, oh, oh. He, they said, what? And he said, we're changing. And he said, well, you, we don't mind if you change it for Ireland. That's no problem to us. But in America, we're calling it Under the Hawthorne Tree. And he finally said, actually, you know something? Maybe it's not a bad name after all, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you know, I firmly believe by keeping that title and using it, it has really helped the book because everywhere I go, people ask me about the title, why did I call the book that? And of course, obviously, you go out overseas, they don't know what a Hawthorne tree is. And I end up telling the story about these three small skeletons found under a Hawthorne tree. And I really feel it has kept the book very connected to the actual original story of the family, these three children who died. And if I'd had another title, it wouldn't have worked as well. So titles are so important. Wildflower Girl, Peggy, she was always picking flowers in Under the Hawthorne Tree. And in America, um, the women who were very wealthy were considered my precious bloom, my rosebud. The, the husbands would call them all these names, you know, and they had all these beautiful flowers. And I always felt the maids, no one cared about them. They were downtrodden. But if you ever walk through a field of wildflowers, you might flatten them down, but you come back a few hours later and they're all growing still. And the felt she was like that. And fields of home then, the field, you know, John B. Keane wrote a very famous play called The Field. 
and it was about the fields, how important to have a field of your own is in, and not to be your home. And that's why I called it Fields of Home, because it's all centered around this little field, which, you know, at the time of the famine, nobody owned their field. That was a problem. And then suddenly you had a field which gave you great possibilities. M Mrs. Haggerty wants to know, uh, do you prefer writing for children or adults? I love both. Once it's a story, sometimes the story comes into my head and it can't be for children because the topic is too old and too uh, different. But uh, a lot of my adult books, you know, girls of 11, 12, 13, 14 are reading them, there's no problem. Um, and of course, lots of my children's books, loads of adults are reading them. So I'm very lucky. My market is anywhere from 7 to 90, <laughs> which is really unusual for a writer. But I have a huge market and um, loads of readers of all ages, which I absolutely love. And uh, so, no, I just get the story in my head and sometimes it's a children's story. I've done a few picture books, too. So sometimes it's a really small little story, you know, about a, a granny and a, a garden and a snail. You know, it depends what the story that comes. And then I just trust my instinct to write that. And I'm very lucky. I'm not really under any pressure from publishers to write you know, the same story the whole time. I just write the story I want, and then if I'm lucky, they'll take it and they'll publish it. Um, we're in our last few minutes, so yeah. we're just going to take as many yeah. questions as we can. With Jessica from Balbriggan, uh, how do you feel when you found out your book had been translated into so many different languages? Oh, I was so honoured. And just to think of children around the world reading it in, in France and in Mexico and in China and Japan. And uh, I actually met my Turkish translator there recently. It's going into Turkish and it's in Arabic and it's... It's everywhere. It's just amazing. And uh, we have a question from Sanan's Primary School in Derry. This is quick fire questions. Have you won any awards? Yes, I've won lots of book awards. My biggest one is called the IRA, which is actually the International Reading Association Award, which I'd go out to America to receive. It's one of the biggest children's book awards in America. And one of my favourites is called the Kalbach Klapperschlanger, which was in Frankfurt, Germany. All the kids voted for their book of the year and um, under the Hawthorne Tree won it. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> and, and I didn't it's a little wooden <laughs> toy. Only. It's not a. It's not a fancy gold or, or silver. It's a little wooden toy. And it's called the Kalbach Klapperschlanger. Caitlin from uh, Nazareth House Primary School wants to know if you were emotional when you wrote about Bridget dying. Oh, I was so emotional when I wrote that because um, you know, for a mother to lose her her child and for brothers and sisters to lose their their, their, their baby sister was so hard. But um, I knew it was very important to put that in the book because I was writing about people dying and you couldn't really, it would be totally wrong if I hadn't you know, brought that in subject into the book. So um, I got very upset and I remember at different parts of the book writing when I got upset about things and um, my kids were in play group, my older kids, and I remember going to collect, collect from play group and I'd be all red eyed because I, I have these awful eyes that get really red when I cry and face, you know, mm. and uh, the other one would say, are you okay? And I'd say, oh, I was just writing this morning, <laughs> you know, and I write and every book I get involved, I get very emotional in the story and um, get angry, get cross, get scared, get, fu get funny, whatever the emotion in the book, I'm going through all that emotion. And I think it's very important to have emotion in a book. If you write a story and it's just like that, it's going to be a really boring story. And emotions is what change a book, you know, whether it's angry or sad or happy or funny or scared or creepy or whatever it is, but emotion has to come into it. And I suppose to, to, to finish off our last question yeah. is, what advice would you give to the two, three thousand children who are watching this now in terms of what you've experienced and what words of wisdom you'd give to those well, people? The best words of wisdom I can, I can give anybody is to be curious about life, about um, you know yourself, about finding out about things, about history, where you live, things around you, um, to read a lot, to write a lot, and to try and be happy. Thing, I'm a very happy person, I'm very lucky, I'm blessed with happiness, and to be happy and um, you know, explore the avenues that make you happy because it's very easy to push into something you don't want to do. And, but it's much better to do something you want. I remember when we were kids, you, my, my parents, and parents in our generation, if you were bad at something that sent you, oh, she can't play tennis for anything, she better go to tennis lessons. And you know, um, so the worse you are at a thing, the more chance you'd be sent to do it. But now parents, thank God, are much better. And they say, oh, he loves football, or he loves this, we'll join with the football club. But in our day, if you couldn't do a thing, oh, we'd better join up immediately to do that. And my sister and I'd be sent off doing awful things. And we all hated them. And then. I, my sister was sent to art classes and I was sent to drama classes. And all I wanted was to be drawing because I love drawing and doing art. And my sister, what she wanted was to be acting and thing. 
and we were both sent to the different classes. And she'd come home for art classes, and I'd be saying, oh, let me see, how did you draw that eye? How did you draw that ear? She what did you do in your drama class today? And if my parents had only just swapped us around, it would have made far more sense, you know? <laughs> so do what you, you like doing, and be curious about life, about people, about places, about houses, about gardens, about woods. Because everywhere there's stories all around you, and try and get into that. It's fantastic advice. And Thank you very much for a very brilliant um, I really interview. enjoyed it. It's been great fun. I hope people watching it have enjoyed sure. it too. I've, I've, enjoyed I've had, it had great fun. Everyone. This little cottage by the turf fire. It's been just lovely. Great. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who was involved in this video conference, the Northeastern Board TV, National Museums, the NI, O'Brien Press, who have asked Marita to come, come up, and obviously Marita herself, and the schools involved. We have 113 schools in this video conference, which is the biggest video conference we've ever done in C2K, and we're delighted to have you all in. This is a very um, important day because the 5th of February uh, is Internet Safety Day. So we would like you to think about your safety online. The internet is a fantastic resource. We'd like you to think about how safe are you online, and if something upsets you or disturbs you, then report it to an adult, a teacher, parent, guardian, uh, someone you can trust, uh, and, and don't feel that it's uh, uncomfortable or, or it's a bad thing. Just report that and you'll be safe online and enjoy the great learning that you can take part in online. So from the Ulster American Folk Park, uh, thank you for joining us and hope to see you again soon.